I would love to introduce the speakers. Um, first one up is uh, Jan Tallinn. Um, Jan, I cannot thank you enough for uh, really like paying us the honor to participate now, I think, uh, in a third virtual meeting with us. Uh, it's really, really, really nice. I much appreciate you taking time. I think, you know, uh, you are actually one of the uh, one of the people that um, led us to start this uh, this hive mind in the first place, um, you have with a few others, uh, kind of like been brainstorming on opportunities for change from COVID nineteen in a in a really just incredibly um, incredibly grounding and, uh, and 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 inspiring way for a while. And so I really salute you for and um, being on the ball so early. Uh, I'm not surprised though. Uh, you have not only been founding engineer of uh, of Skype, but then have kind of like launched on to really um spend, like launch full, fully into um i think uh, right now 50 50 uh, investing uh, versus philanthropy on really just focusing your efforts on uh, trying to get uh, beneficial long-term futures for humanity going you have uh, co-founded the future of life institute and uh, you have co-founded a few fantastic organizations in europe uh, you are donating uh, to much of the ecosystem uh, really across the globe. So uh, it's and really thanks to you that so many, I think, organizations uh, are flourishing these days. And uh, we're hopefully going to talk a little bit about a few efforts that you've uh, specifically funded uh, uh, in the next uh, few a few minutes. One of them that, you know, I think we've pointed out before is Metaculous, which is a, a fantastic prediction tool that you have really uh, kind of like bareheaded especially right now because they've set up a, a new pandemic effort so thank you so much for your efforts it's really really nice to have you um i am going to unmute all the speakers right now uh, in case you'd like to chime in uh, christine as well thank you thank and, you very much uh, for the kind words on. yeah thank you so much for joining again this is great um okay next one up uh, we have uh, i'm seeing christine over here uh, Christine is uh, the co-founder of Foresight Institute, which is the institute that I work for. Um, and she's been really, I think, at it for like 34 years now, at least with our organization. So I think she can uh, hopefully give a really nice uh, kind of like um, introduction, explanation for how, uh, you know, how, how this, um, how we can steer uh, beneficial futures from the nonprofit angle. Uh, she hasn't only been with Foresight, but also uh, has been pro bono advising a bunch of other nonprofits and people that are trying to set up uh, efforts for beneficial long-term futures, uh, both in the resilient uh, kind of like bucket, but also in the really pushing for high impact uh, science bucket, which are overlapping, but not all the same. So I'm really excited to have you, Christine. Thank you for joining. Uh, you're always like, a pretty, uh, pretty practical guide to getting things rolling. Thanks for joining. Glad to be here. Um, all right. All right, great. Uh, then next one up, uh, I already saw him here. I'm, I'm on the mosaic view, so I'm trying to find uh, Andrew Zarasin. Uh, Andrew, I met uh, at uh, um, a meeting that was hosted, co-hosted by the Future of Life Institute. Um, uh, last year in January, seems like ages ago, and he's from the world at Templeton Charity Foundation, and I just unmuted you too. Welcome, uh, Andrew. I think uh, you were quite inspiring. Uh, you had a really, uh, I think, quite holistic and very, I think, uh, humane uh, perception of, you know, what we could be doing for beneficial long-term futures. And um, I'm really happy that you're here. I think you've been uh, stewarding fantastic efforts uh, from the Bahamas, I think. Uh, and you were already here at a previous salon, actually at uh, the one, uh, the, the kick of Salon on um, how can we actually make humane long-term futures possible last week where we talked a little bit more about culture setting and you had a, a very, I think, um, a very grounding perspective on what it actually is that uh, makes humanity flourishing. So I really, uh, uh, I really admire you for that. Thank you for joining this Salon as well. I'm quite, quite excited about what you'll share with us. Uh, and then last one up, let's see if we have him in here. Yes, Kevin. Kevin, I have not met you yet. So it's such a pleasure to have you here. I just unmuted you. Nice uh, Kevin you. is from Apollo VC. Uh, Apollo VC, uh, we've just recently started uh, collaborating with a little bit. We had Niels over for longevity investment uh, panel. And I'm personally very excited because uh, Niels and Ole, who are from Apollo, are both from Hamburg, which is where I'm from. And uh, it, it's a really fantastic, Apollo VC is a fantastic effort and trying to put uh, venture capital uh, toward uh, specifically longevity, but really with this longer focus on, hey, maybe longevity is also a way to get people more excited about 
first living longer themselves uh, and then getting them uh, have more skin in the game to care about long-term futures on a quite personal level. So I'm really happy to have you here, Kevin. I think you're in San Diego, is this correct? Yep, I'm in uh, sunny, sunny San Diego right now. <laughs> thanks for having oh, me. Oh, amazing. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Okay, everyone. Um, I hope that uh, we can keep this chat quite lively. Please comment away if you want your voice heard on the questions that are on the Google Doc, which I'm going to ask the speakers now. Please, please comment on the Google Doc. We f currently ran out of space, but just comment under the sections that are already pre-compiled. Um, because whatever you post in the chat will be lost after this meeting. I want to keep the chat quite informal. So whatever you'd love for us to include in the, in the final report of this meeting, please comment on the Google Docs, okay? Uh, so we can be quite informal in the chat. Okay, great. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, I think maybe to get, to get people a little bit up to speed because many people here, I think, especially if they're interested in investing and in uh, getting their, um, their feet wet in philanthropy, uh, I think for them, it's usually quite uh, inspiring to hear like more personal kind of history um, rather than just uh, kind of like uh, rational arguments for investing. So if you could uh, start maybe a little bit by what's your investment or philanthropy history and how has this shape your theory of change. So uh, maybe give a little bit more background for maybe a minute each, and then uh, we'll dive into uh, the, the gritty aspect. Jan, do you want to start? Uh, so, sure. Um, I think my, I think my kind of, uh, uh, Word model has influenced my, both my investment uh, and philanthropy, uh, and not so much kind of vice versa. Uh, of course, like if you're gonna, the nice thing about the investment is that you do, do get feedback, so you're gonna tend to um, sort of uh, correct uh, your policies, so to speak. Uh, but I, I, I do think that um, both my investment and philanthropy, they are kind of heavily influenced by just things that I consider good arguments. Uh, so if somebody makes a good argument that, that this is a, uh, something that uh, could be valuable in the future or, or could be kind of make a significant positive change in the future, uh, then uh, I will pay attention even if uh, many other people don't. So I think that's just, I think there's uh, this uh, term called uh, correct contrarian cluster. If you search on, on uh, less wrong. Uh, so I try to be part of the correct contrarian cluster, both in my philanthropy and my investment. Yeah, you are definitely, I think, one of the people that uh, is very principle driven in this. You, you've written about it really fantastically and transparently. And uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a really nice onboarding guide for how people could think about that. So I welcome people to, to check that out as well. Um, all right, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, Christine, would you uh, like to go? What What is your philanthropy history? And did you first have a theory of change, uh, or did you kind of like kind of like get get uh, get corralled into this, and then uh, kind of like jump jump on the track? Well, I like the uh, quote we've all heard from Margaret Mead: "Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has." and take it back an earlier step from that and say, well, what happens before you have a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens? Well, there's an idea. Someone has an idea. Some extremely innovative person has a brilliant idea. Uh, and then you form the small group uh, of thoughtful, committed people. So, so that's when um, a visionary funder or visionary facilitator has the highest leverage. When, that when the funder um, or facilitator is able to identify something very early stage, when you have a brilliant genius with an idea um, who has maybe attracted a small number of people who say, yeah, this is right, this is right. Um, that's, I think, the, the term Jan just used was the correct contrarian cluster, right? These, this is, these are unusual people, you know? Um, so I think for people like me, and obviously Jan, I guess, is doing this too, uh, we search out 
for these, uh, these super high payoff ideas. Very early stage, uh, most funders are not able to step in uh, at that level because uh, it, looks, uh, it looks, the odds look too long, right? Um, so I look for those long shot high payoff goals. I look in the STEM area because um, I think uh, there's huge uh, low hanging fruit still available in STEM. That's not that, not that I'm not interested in other areas, it's just where I happen to be. Um, so we look for uh, multidisciplinary geniuses. We bring them together with domain experts to uh, flesh out their ideas, and then we reward their success with prizes. So uh, when you're a very small organization or one person, that's how you can move things uh, forward the fastest. All right, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, next one up, we have Andrew Seracin. I think you're still unmuted or can unmute yourself. I'll unmute you now. Andrew, what's your theory of change? And was your theory of change inspired by uh, your history or ha ha did you always grow up with a strong theory of change that then inspired every, se every step along the way that you did? Yeah, no, I think um, I was, I, my first phrase uh, as, a, as a toddler was theory of change. So it sort of came <laughs> yeah, of course. fully, That's for all of us. fully uh, you know, formed from the womb. Uh, no, but um, I think, you know, just so my, my I've had a, a kind of four part career starting as a researcher in infectious disease, actually uh, trained in infectious disease biology, uh, working in Africa, primarily focused on malaria. So. You know, um, like Christine mentioned, just a strong orientation towards technology um, or applications of technology, you know, that serve social goals. Uh, and so, you know, my first part of the career was was dedicated to vaccine and drug development for for a disease that still kills almost a million children. Um, there's been a lot of progress. That is malaria. Um, and sort of secondly, then, you know, after that, as a researcher, I, I, I went to the Gates Foundation and, and worked on the Grand Challenges in Global Health Program, um, you know, uh, trying to find really innovative ideas. Um, and so, so through that program, I think ultimately, maybe 3,000 different ideas were funded at a $100,000 level, um, you know, and that's still going, the program, after about 12 years. Uh, so I think I've, you know, during that time, I was there for seven of that 12 years. And uh, I think I've, you know, probably read more, you know, ideas than almost any person on the planet. These are two page applications from, you know, researchers in, in um, over 100 countries. Uh, and, I, and then, you know, um, thirdly worked, um, I started a biotech company focused on beneficial bacteria. Again, um, the social goal in this case was to remove antibiotics from the food supply. Um, and then more recently work, you know, having the opportunity to lead the Templeton World Charity Foundation. Um, so I've sort of been a hybrid across, you know, venture backed companies, science in the academy and philanthropy. And I think that there's probably um, maybe three or four different dimensions that I evaluate ideas based on. One um, is that it, you know, having the benefit of sort of scanning the possible idea space, I really look for highly differentiated concepts. So uh, things which are an outlier versus conventional uh, thinking, conventional funding sources. Um, oftentimes that kind of um, is on the basis of a hunch, you know, so, so actually, you know, the arguments may not actually be very good or the sort of rational calculus may not be that good, but you know, it's on the basis of instinct uh, that this is a highly differentiated. Sort of secondly, um, I'm a big believer in simplicity. simplicity. So you, you really, uh, one of the projects that stands out in my mind, you know, is both highly differentiated and, sim and, and simple, was a researcher who studied the light waves that are emitted on the event horizon, or ju just beyond the event horizon uh, at a black hole. And uh, those are the same wavelengths that mosquitoes see at. And so he was an expert at manipulating these light fields of a certain of a certain kind of wavelength. And so he came up with an idea of creating a, a, a sort of perimeter field um, that mosquitoes couldn't travel through. 
So you can think about like an invisible mosquito net. And this was just an astrophysicist um, had a completely different solution than most public health researchers, right? And so highly differentiated, highly simple, and it had multiple strategic advantages over like chemical control. So um, I think all of those things combined are the sort of things that I, you know, make a good theory of change, you know, multiple competitive advantages, very simple to get your mind across, um, and then, uh, and then really differentiated. So, so, um, uh, that's what I've, I've sort of come to after nice. that kind of checkered career. Thanks. That's nice. You already tackled, that's great. You already tackled, uh, the next question that we had of what factors did you find the, to be the most uh, indicative of success or failure? That's awesome. You did two in one, uh, Kevin, um, Kevin, what about you? Um, I think over at Apollo, our theory of change lies under the premise that aging is actually, you were able to modulate it. Um, the aging process in itself, it's been shown time and time again in a bunch of um, animal or model systems that it is indeed possible to kind of increase both the health span, the time spent disease free, and the lifespan of um, animals. And this kind of, with this theory of change that we have of um, being able to target aging is what really um, influences, I guess, what we want to invest in. Um, there's established um, hallmarks of aging. And currently in our paradigm of treating disease, it's kind of described as whack-a-mole medicine, where um, one thing pops up, we address that. The next thing pops up, we address that. Um, but if you really think about it, um, age is the biggest risk factor for developing neurodegenerative disease, uh, cancers, autoimmune disorders. Um, so in really um, looking for investment opportunities that leverage these findings of um, targeting the basic mechanisms of aging, um, we hope to both counteract age-related disease and just really push, um, increase the number of years, I guess, that humans are able to live in good, good health. All right, lovely. Thank you so much. I know that, uh, Jan, you also have, like, I think a really good... Um, model for what do you think which factors do you find the most indicative of success or failures um and like for nonprofits, you definitely have a really good one i would also be interested uh, for companies how you go about that okay uh so yeah with companies um, basically, recent I find myself focusing more on my on my philanthropy and and how to focus that, because with companies I always try to kind of uh, take shortcuts because I don't consider myself a like full time investor, and those shortcuts usually have been just like invest uh, sort of either in people that I already know or with people that I already know. Or sometimes some like uh, some kind of strategic investments that I do think that uh, are useful not so much to kind of uh, get a good return on money, but to in order to have a ticket to the company and uh, kind of as I say hang around in their kitchen and talk about that that uh, um, they should kind of think more about safety uh, and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, like I, I do think that. Uh, I'm actually way more excited to talk about uh, like the stuff that I've done philanthropically because like investments. Yeah, is, please go <laughs> for it. <laughs> okay. So, because I do think that actually kind of as a, on a strategic level, uh, investing is like way more constrained than philanthropy uh, because like you already have like your kind of talk, your work cut out for you. You ha have your target of like maximizing your ROI or, or serving your clients who usually are your investors. If you like people always kind of forget that uh, quite often forget that like a VC, like investing is only half of VC's job. The other half is raising money. And like the, the, the people that raise money from other clients. So they, they, anyway, they're very, very constrained when it comes to uh, actually this making decisions. But with philanthropy, what I've done like uh, for many years, is kind of taking this sort of um, uh, diversified portfolio approach uh, where I have given uh, like small amounts um, to, uh, like, uh, to you know, many organizations and projects and then like see if they're gonna persist. Uh, so if they, if they will kind of uh, um, uh, continue 
to uh, exist and grow, then I will gonna gradually increase uh, my sort of bets, like uh, just like uh, in an investment portfolio, you would. Uh, however, recently, uh, that is like for the last six months, uh, me and uh, a few of my friends, like Andrew Critch and uh, Oliver Habrika, we've been uh, developing a process called S process, uh, which is really cool. <laughs> the the idea is that instead of uh, having uh, like uh, sort of some kind of uh, decision mechanism that sits, sits on the top of uh, incoming stream of opportunities and then like kind of picks them off like one by one, like this is good, this is not, this is good. You basically build a mechanism, which is uh, like a two layer mechanism. On, like on the first layer, you have like opportunities. And second layer, we have like what we call recommenders. They're basically people who are, uh, who can look at uh, opportunities and, and give their opinion. And one way of, uh, and then on top there are funders, there can, can be multiple funders. Uh, so this thing looks like a two layer neural network. Uh, and uh, connections are basically, you can think of them as pipes. So like the way the, way the uh, you know, grant rounds work is that you have these applications and then you have recommenders laying pipes to the, uh, to the opportunities. And those pipes are basically marginal value functions. Like when, the more money goes through it, that they're kind of the narrower they become. So it's like uh, they're kind of dynamic pipes. And the job of the philanthropist, like the funders, is not to evaluate opportunities, but evaluate how well the pipes were laid. So like you're, you're not evaluating the opportunities, you're evaluating the evaluators, uh, which basically it has like so many nice properties that I could go on and on. But like, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, it looks really good, uh, the, the system, and we're still gonna beta testing it. And, and I hope that uh, we will be able to like, kind of recruit more and more uh, funders to this uh, process in the future. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think you've also written about that, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna share it here uh, in a second. I think one thing uh, I um, I looked up a recent interview that you did, a recent podcast interview, and one thing that really stood out to me was that a while ago you were um, kind of like realizing, okay, how can I have the biggest impact? And I think one of the things that was on your list was actually in inviting other folks uh, who have uh, significant funds to donate, to donate it um, for existential risk prevention. Um, and uh, I think you talked to over a thousand billionaires or over a hundred billionaires or something. And you said at the beginning, it was, uh, it was really hard to onboard them. So I would love to, to know a little bit, like what was your experience there and how do you think that, uh, you know, that, what do you think is a really good narrative to bring them on board? Like, when were you successful, uh, if at all? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, indeed, I tried uh, quite a lot. Uh, not, not like hundreds. Uh, I would say like a dozen or somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, billionaires. Uh, That's good enough. Yeah. Uh, and I don't actually just have like much to show for it. Um, like one of the first uh, uh, people that I met in this uh, existential risk ecosystem was Peter Thiel. And he actually said, kind of, if I remember correctly, predicted that it's kind of pointless to talk to billionaires because like uh, billionaires, A, have gotten to the point where they are by being very right about uh, some very important things. And in the process, they have surrounded themselves with uh, yes men. So if you go to them and say that, look, you've been most, you've been kind of, you missed the, one of the most important facts about the world. Uh, that's like, that's just going to be like, I mean, it, it will, in my experience, it will kind of yield like a potentially intellectually uh, interesting discussion, but uh, no action. Uh, and um, so I kind of, at some point, I kind of, uh, joke that it's, I find it easier to spend X amount of time uh, making X and Y amount of dollars than spending uh, X amount of time uh, kind of raising Y amount of uh, dollars for any value of X and Y. So, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't think uh, I'm a like very good um, example of, of, of how, to, how to raise. I just see, think it's like super difficult. Yeah. Oh man. Let's see if we can if we can make a good case now. I think with uh, with COVID nineteen. Uh, so the next question uh, to my panelists is really already getting into 
uh, the current crisis. And, you know, I think, I mean, seriously though, like um, for many of us who've already cared for a longer time, and I'm not only speaking to the panelists, I'm also speaking to many participants uh, here in this chat of whom I know that too, right? Like, uh, it really does seem like, you know, man, the, the thing that many of us were worried about um, is what, what Jan Tallinn calls it actually like a minimum viable catastrophe. <laughs> uh, is like a minimum viable catastrophe has occurred now in the sense that finally there's something uh, that, you know, kind of like wakes up the, the, uh, the uh, like, let's say the more global context to uh, things that we are generally more, more worried about, right? Like long-term resilience and long-term scientific pro uh, progress and the long-term um, kind of like an advancement of the benefit of life. So it does seem like there's currently like this unique opportunity to make a case for uh, people that may have not opted in before uh, to opt into actually supporting those causes, right? There's a small time window in which this particular uh, issue will get, uh, let's say, at least a little bit of publicity. So my question uh, to the panelists is how, how can we make a good case that um, who, who do you think uh, we could address right now? For whom is this actually interesting uh, now more than before to now invest in high impact science and long-term resilience? And how, do you, and, and how do you think could we make a good case for that now there's a good time to be doing this? Um, Christine, would you like to tackle that first? Well, so in theory, both public and philanthropic investors should get more excited. Um, because of this, because of this crisis, things are up in the air. People are doing things that were unthinkable not long ago. Uh, for example, we're seeing big changes in spending coming out of Washington, D.C., just huge, sudden changes uh, coming. So, um, so I think things are possible that were not possible a short while ago. Now, if we want private investors to get more excited about um, funding things in the resilience or high impact areas. Um, I think there may be some public policy changes needed, which again, we're seeing big changes in Washington. There's no reason why we shouldn't think about big changes in policy. Um, I haven't looked lately at what the research credits look like, but maybe they should be increased. Um, how, how are the tax write-offs for long-term R&D? Um, I know that to the general public, um, it looks peculiar that we don't tax uh, certain types of venture capital compensation more. Uh, it looks unfair. Uh, and because they don't have a clear understanding of the difference between venture capital and say, uh, what's done on Wall Street, uh, to them, these things all look the same. Uh, it just seems like, oh, we're, we're rewarding the wrong kinds of people. But being out here in Silicon Valley, I know that um, we need the very brightest folks to go into uh, science and technology uh, investing if we want to make real progress. So I would say, you know, there are other goals in the tax structure besides fairness. We want to reward people for doing what we want done as a country. Um, and that goes for other countries too. If you want really great, um, science and technology investments from the public, from the, from the private sector, you have to let those rewards happen. So um, yeah, I would say in theory, there's opportunities across the board. Uh, it's a question of, of uh, looking at our, our public policies holding us back and what needs to be changed. Now's a great time to get in there and change them. Oh, Alison, you're frozen. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm okay. just having bandwidth. Very good. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. No, I'm with you. I'm with you, Christine. Uh, all right. Thanks. I think that's, uh, that's a, quite an inspiring call to action. Uh, Kevin, do you think, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, especially the, uh, the sector of longevity, uh, I think uh, not tomorrow, but the day after. So um, it would be interesting for you to already maybe foreshadow why is that particular field maybe now a better opportunity and to invest in than before, given the strong correlations uh, between you know age and susceptibility to COVID nineteen. Okay, yeah, I think uh, with this pandemic, it, it perfectly highlights the need for sort of rejuvenation therapies or 
Um, we've seen a disproportionate amount of uh, senior citizens affected by um, COVID-19. And um, this has been characterized within the aged individual. Um, there's a concept called immunosenescence and um, pretty much the function of one's immune system declines. So um, even with a lot of our R&D efforts in developing a vaccine, um, vaccines need to rely on kind of a functional immune system in order to um, prove efficacy. So I think with this current um, situation that we have going on, it really highlights the opportunity to apply a lot of these insights that we've made from the longevity field and really gives us a key target to pursue. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I welcome everyone who's interested in the particular field to attend our salon on Wednesday on this. Um, okay, uh, Andrew, um, and then perhaps Jan, if you have anything to add, uh, would you like to kind of make a case for why you think that specifically right now there's a major opportunity to onboard potentially new folks into the space who weren't interested before? Hi, everybody. So, Andrew, uh, you're unmuted. Yeah, can you hear me? Good, good, good. Um, I mean, so what you're effectively trying to do is make an investment case for prevention um, across the board. Uh, that's what the big, uh, the big sort of uh, learning here from the coronavirus crisis is, is, is um, try and um, liberate capital now to prevent something in the future from happening. Um, so I'm not sure, it, it's actually, this, this panel's well-timed. Today is, uh, there's a major pledging conference um, uh, centralized with the European Commission for something called ACT, um, access, Accessing Coronavirus Tools, which covers drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines today. And there's a pledging conference amongst major donors of uh, $8 billion uh, will be raised today for um, across the tool set for for coronavirus so you you see you see this i mean we've seen we saw this with ebola we saw this with swine flu and with bird flu um, where an event happens and and there's this big mobilization of resources and eight billion dollars is you know um, a, a fairly large uh, capital set in order to be able to to invest in these kinds of things but i think um Along the way, you need mechanisms to string together the supply chain or the value chain for every uh, tool in the toolbox. And um, it's no surprise that, like, let's just take vaccines, for example. It's no surprise that the major vaccine candidates that, that are, are being developed today either come out of an academic lab, like in the case of the Oxford vaccine, or was a you know an innovative startup like Moderna, um, that 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 big pharma, uh, given risk aversion, you know, off um, sort of outsourced their risk to to innovative um, um, uh, biotech companies. The reason that's important is because that none of those individual biotech companies or their academic partners know how to scale the manufacturing of the vaccine. So you need to put in incentives for pharma companies to build the manufacturing capacity uh, and, to, you know, and to generate a volume guarantee for a tool. I think that kind of model, um, this has been tried a couple of times so that you know, there's a model, um, uh, something called the uh, advanced market commitment, which is basically a supply guarantee for a product if a major firm invests in the, in the capacity. Um, so any, you, know, you can go through your sort of list of technological solutions for whatever future crisis, but you need these kinds of market guarantees to mobilize the private sector resources. Again, the public sector resources will, you know, have been, have been liberated, um, but you need the private sector uh, resources in order to actually develop and scale, you know, the tool that you're, ta you're talking about. So um, uh, I think in the case of coronavirus, you know, we'll see what happens. I think Ebola, was it was a disappointment you know Merck just I'll, I'll end with this example Merck invested t you know millions of dollars in a, an Ebola virus vaccine that they then have been unable to sell and so you know you see them sitting on the sidelines of this um, vaccine manufacturing 
um, you know, frenzy right now for coronavirus because of their past history. And so there weren't the appropriate kind of financial tools to incentivize, incentivize private sector investment. Um, and we need all of these things to work together in order to get, you know, uh, an investment in prevention writ large. Yeah, very nice. Um, Jan, do you maybe have a few words on this? And are there maybe already like any specific, let's say, areas that you'd like to draw people's attention to? Right. So um, I do think that the investment, uh, so like looking at from investment side, I think investments basically go where market goes and uh, market goes where people go. And the invest investment community, there is this like one uh, half joking, but I think like has like a very strong kernel of truth uh, classification of investment opportunities. You can basically uh, divide them into so-called painkillers and vitamins. And like the common knowledge is that it's very hard to sell vitamins, uh, whereas like painkillers are, are very easy to sell. And uh, I do think that like this, all these kind of long-term uh, long investments uh, addressing long-term problems, they, this, they tend to suffer from the fact that they are, you're basically selling vitamins. And uh, now like there is like, clearly it's going to be like some kind of uh, bump or some, some kind of interest, perhaps like driven from uh, government side, um, government, especially if they have been like very embarrassed by not being ready might want to kind of invest and thereby kind of drive market demand towards purchasing more vitamins. But, uh, uh, but like I, I, in long run, I don't think it's going to be sustainable. I think people will stop taking vitamins again. Uh, on the philanthropy side, uh, I think there's another interesting effect because like this minimum viable global catastrophe, uh, as I've been saying, basically gives people like actual lived experience of what the species-wide problem looks like. Therefore, philanthropists who try to address species-wide problems, they have like a really good example to point to that this is the class of things that are working on, whereas like previously they didn't. And so like they, what they, what they uh, did could, as I know from experience, it can be shot like shut down really easily by calling it science fiction. Uh, so I think like it's, I think it's going to be much better uh, from that particular perspective. What kind of concrete things is going to enable? I'm not sure yet. Uh, time will tell. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. Are there maybe any areas that you know you think are you could make a particularly good case for now to hop onto uh, after COVID-19? Well, a couple of things. One is we could clearly need fast manufacturing. We need uh, just faster manufacturing, whether it's PPE or vaccines. Um, and fast manufacturing, as you know well, is one of the applications of um, atomically precise manufacturing. And so that's where, that's Foresight's already working on that. And it may, we can make a better case than ever on that. Um, and I also just want to agree with Kevin's point. Um, let's, if you look at the numbers, COVID is mostly a disease of aging. Not 100%, but darn, you know, very close. So uh, hopefully this will help drive, let's, you know, aging research is basically fundamental health research, right? So we can make, an ex we can make a case that these are tightly related. And so um, aging research um, should be better funded. Um, it will push forward fundamental medical research and help prevent future events like we're going through now. So yeah. I would say, our, and these are our two favorite things in Foresight, right? Atomically precise manufacturing and longevity research. So yeah, both of our top things yeah. are, should, should, should be easier to find now. Well, I think that, you know, we already saw like, like even after last year when we did, uh, when we ramped up our longevity work, we saw an insane spike in interest so much so that we really started with four major longevity kind of like very focused uh, technical competitions and uh, and salons, uh, the last one just before COVID-19. So I do think that there was already a lot of appetite popping up and I'm, I'm hoping that this will only accelerate now. Um, do you know, because, you know, one of the things, I mean, we, we once did a, a workshop at Effective Altruism Global on the fact that uh, many of the projects that 
may be uh, um, high reward are also high risk or are foundational in a way where it's potentially harder to track them. You know, is there a good uh, case to make for uh, funding those types of efforts now? Things that are harder to track? Yeah, I mean, you, mean? you know, I think many of the things that are, are ultimately, you know, uh, ambitious and quite successful are uh, hard to track at the Right. So yeah, um, to measure high impact projects, uh, but you know, many of the things are really You're cutting in and out, Allison. I'll just wing it. So um, yeah, I think we're, we're kind of in a Sputnik moment for those of you who, uh, who are young and maybe not, don't remember, Sputnik was a satellite that the Russians launched and got the other countries um, excited about, hey, look what's possible and gee, do we really wanna be behind on this? Uh, and it, so it led to a huge refocusing on STEM education, STEM funding, uh, talent increases, and I think if we want to improve science and technology in any country, including the U.S., we need to um, pay our teachers more, right? And we need to, to pay our teachers and our research staff more. Hopefully we'll get Allison. Yeah. Allison has, oh, there she is. Yeah, okay. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back, I'm back. Satellite Wi-Fi. <laughs> It's a treat. All right, thanks, Christine. I just got the end of it. Um, thank you so much for that. And I definitely agree. And I could actually uh, come out. Okay, Allison's cutting in and out. I guess I'll jump in and, and fill in for her. I have her list of questions here so I can move forward. Um, the next question she was gonna ask us is how can we make funding of um, hard to measure efforts, for example, foundational science, science shared scientific infrastructure, high risk, high reward projects more tractable? And I think it would be fun to, since we're very short on time, jump forward to the last question, which is, are there innovative new funding models we could consider experimenting with? So new funding models. Okay, I'm back. Okay, Allison, yes. I just Sorry, asked a question. So I suggest we just go with it, okay? Yes. So what I asked was, are there yeah, let's go. new funding models we could consider experimenting with? Who do you want to throw this to? Um, well, Jan already answered this to some extent. Is there anyone else who'd like to tackle this? One thing that was pitched to me, for example, was how about this model where instead of uh, trying to just uh, donate to nonprofits, we do something that's a little bit more different, which is, maybe uh, finding out a way in which we could uh, use um, ways that are already generating in, uh, that are already generating funding uh, that are already generating uh, income for example um, things like laundromats which are apparently profitable uh, already after a year or something or uh, food trucks uh, or even um, uh, bank cashier uh, stations those are apparently projects that are not really often looked at and they're quite innovative funding opportunities you basically generate a profit even after a year if enough people pulled in uh, you could take a lot of those facilities over and you would generate money while also having a new kind of like way in which you could advertise positive futurist ideas to a market that is uh, not often in contact uh, with those ideas years uh, in the same way that like you know many of the bay area crowd is so i thought that was a really cool model of like trying to do something a little bit more different um and you know like laundromats uh, and, and and cashier uh, and cashier stations are not something that we usually look at in the nonprofit sector but this would be something that you know is generating income via also maybe expanding our reach a little bit to a sector that is not currently served um, so that was one that I recently heard of. If anyone else has a different one, I would love to hear it. And then we take questions from participants. Uh, any one of the panelists, uh, if you're interested in answering this one, I'm going to unmute you uh, all right now. Well, I'll just throw in a couple things. One is that, you know, most of the research money in the U.S. at least is spent by the federal government. But um, the way they do it is... Uh, they force the researchers in academia to spend a tremendous amount of time filling out research grant proposals, most of which are not funded. So it's, it's, it's a terrible way to force people to spend their time. 
Uh, and part of it is that the funding is delivered in little tiny chunks. So they have to keep re reapplying all the time. So first, get away from this, these short-term awards, do long-term awards, larger awards, more uh, early career awards. And you know, in academia, I say this as a boomer, um, we used to have retirement age requirements. And uh, at least in the STEM fields, they've kind of shown that uh, keeping folks around for very long periods of time, they tend to get stuck in their current paradigm. And it's, they have huge intellectual property uh, uh, investments in that paradigm. It's very hard to make a change. So it's possible we should look again at those retirement ages. Maybe there was a reason for that. So that's kind of a shocking thing for a boomer to say, but there it is. All right, any other speaker who would like to take this question before we move on to participant questions? Uh, all right, great. Then I'm going to take, I'm seeing a question here from Alfred team. Alfred, I'm gonna unmute you. Thanks for joining again. I think we have David Denkenberger from your team uh, on uh, later, later next week. So I'll unmute you now, Alfred team. Who are you and what's your question? Uh, yeah, hello. So uh, I am a researcher at Alfred. So David Denkenberger is uh, my research operator. Uh, he's not here today. He has to do some work. So uh, happy to see you all. My question is, uh, Christine Patterson mentioned that we need uh, faster construction right now. And I can see that we need that for a lot of other global catastrophic risk. We will need the ramp, uh, quickly ramping up of other solutions. So my question is, how can we ease that on an institutional or governmental level that this could happen? The, so the quickly mobilizing of resources. And who are you directing? Who would like to take that question? Yeah, please direct it. That would be great. Oh, um, well, maybe Christine, I would give it directly back to you since you mentioned uh, the need for it. And I can see it as well. Yeah. Um, what I'm proposing is a pretty fundamental change in how we do manufacturing that, innate, that greatly lowers the cost of these of fast manufacturing. So, um, so this is the goal that I was setting is a longer term goal. It would take a long R and D effort to get there. Um, but I think it would, it would pay off in the end if we, uh, and we are on the path. It's just could be sped up by order of the magnitude with targeted funding saying, super fast manufacturing and be clear and say, well, no, we, we want atomically precise manufacturing. Um, so yeah, mine is a very ambitious goal. It's possible that, uh, that you're looking for something nearer term. Uh, yes and no, depending on the uh, global catastrophe, catastrophic risk we are looking at. Right. Uh, any other speaker who would like to tackle this? I am muted you all, so please feel free. All right, uh, do we Thank have another question? Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for chiming in. Uh, do we have another question uh, from the audience? I think Jenedy, uh, 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 you had uh, a question as well. I'm gonna unmute you now. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So my question uh, derives from the remarks that Jan made, but certainly I'd appreciate anyone else's insights on this as well. And I heard the same from Aubrey de Grey in my conversations with him in regard to the difficulty of reaching some of the billionaires, including the billionaires who are known for being innovative like uh, Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg or uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, and yet uh, they're not devoting the majority of their fortunes uh, into the quest to reverse biological aging, even though as billionaires, uh, they should be keenly aware that they can't take their fortunes with them uh, if and when they die. Uh, so I wonder what you think in their mind uh, would be the stumbling block uh, toward making these kinds of investments, especially since the kinds of investments that would be 
needed on an annual basis are essentially a drop in the bucket compared to what they can afford to give and they would not affect their standard of living or their ability to pursue other endeavors uh, to a significant extent. Jan, I unmuted you if you'd like to take that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the simple answer is that philanthropy is hard. Uh, so uh, like the people that you singled out, I mean, they, I'm pretty sure they're like ridiculously busy and they, they get like a ton of incoming philanthropic requests. So they, uh, I'm betting without knowing them, uh, they will delegate away uh, their philanthropic, philanthropic decisions mostly uh, to people who uh, might not for brand reasons or, what, or, or for what not be into uh, things that are considered science fiction. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think that that would be again, speculative answer why they don't invest or yeah, philanthropically support anti-aging, uh, which, yeah, I think like on the face of it is puzzling. But uh, yeah, I think it's just a matter of, yeah, I would bet that it's, it's a matter of their kind of processes that aren't really capable of handling uh, sort of non-conventional things. All right, neat. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, next one up, we have Brian here. Uh, Brian, thank you for joining us again. I am going to unmute you now. What's your question? Hello, everyone. Um, so my question is uh, for, it, it's mostly about the funding resources for, uh, I guess, open hardware communities uh, globally. So the idea here is things like, uh, since we have uh, technologies like uh, 3D printing now that has made almost everything uh, in so many different countries work much better because uh, people are ready uh, to mitigate their harm. Uh, uh, basically exp expanding and making it more resilient. Uh, so recently, like the industries has uh, themselves been lagging mostly because there was no real case study for how things uh, might be used. But now, like uh, the, everyone is waking up to the potential for three D printing as a, as, a, as a useful technology. Um, so, like th this is one of the possible uh, upsides because people can actually can, can get to see just how fast information about potential solutions can travel and uh, be directly useful in, in an immediate case. Who are you directing this to? So I'm, I'm directing this question to Jan, uh, about mostly about uh, basically promoting the funding for uh, uh, communities and technologies such as that. Oh, sorry, I hey, was uh, Jan, actually, I, I, you. I was just <laughs> responding to someone uh, on the chat, so I, I kind of <laughs> missed the question. Sorry. Can, can someone Brian, else take it? Or? Please repeat. All right, oh. So I'll repeat the question. So. Um, as like um, as mostly as a consequence of uh, uh, just as the openness of the scientific method, many different communities about uh, surrounding uh, technologies like open, open hardware, such as three D printing and, and and things like that, have been extremely useful in in, in this in this catastrophe because uh, people just figured out exactly how how to to try and to solve the problem and then transmit all that at, at uh, digital speeds. So uh, could we figure out ways to democratize more of those technologies uh, and. Uh, fund and the creation and support of those kinds of communities um, globally uh, and then uh, making it possible for things like that to be uh, supported eventually so that whatever happens people are already ready for the information that's available. Yeah so uh, I think it's I mean it's, it's yeah it's just correct that like the, if there's like a need for uh, quickly scaling up manufacturing it, it would be good uh, to, or like some other capacities perhaps, it would be good to have like more decentralized uh, ability to do that. However, with my kind of X risk uh, hat uh, on, uh, I do think that uh, there is like a flip side to that. So like whenever you have more kind of power in the individual hands, you basically are more at the mercy of, uh, of game theory and you have like less ability to coordinate if there's like, like I mean, I think, uh, Slate's, there was like, a, uh, I forget what, which article it was on Slate Star Codex uh, that uh, uh, kind of compared, uh, I think it was after OpenAI launched and compared to the situation to like 
uh, why don't we like uh, make sure that everybody has uh, nuclear weapons and can like make them very easily? So like I think there's like there are kind of like important upsides and important downsides to having like very decentralized and very distributed uh, capabilities in general. I would say. Thank you so much, Jan. I think Andrew would also uh, like to tackle that uh, question. And I think we can make that perhaps the, the final words as well. Um, we're already a minute over time. I want to be very mindful of your time. Yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll wrap up. I actually wanted to, to, to answer the previous question, which was related to, to you know, generosity and philanthropy in, in general. Um, the participants on this, on this hive mind might know of something called the giving pledge which um was an activity started by bill and melinda gates um that has now raised over a trillion dollars of committed resources amongst primarily high net worth individuals and, and billionaires so i don't feel like there's a lack of commitment um once this sort of slow process of recruitment happens the question is and this is really to reinforce jan's point how to um how to activate that fund that you know those funds so i think less than one percent of that trillion dollars has actually been um liberated so to speak precisely because of this gap between an intention um and a fundable project that you know goes through the decision making um process and is ultimately approved by the philanthropist and so so it really has to do with um the mechanism of decision making and the fact that actually some level of expertise and um, is required and contrarian thinking is hard to do when you don't spend it, you know, spend your time um, doing it. So, so I, you know, I think just end with a plug that actually the kind, the scale of the resources we're talking about specifically within philanthropy is not that difficult to, to achieve. Um, the problem is, you know, much more practical and tactical. Thank I you like, so by much. The way, and uh, yeah, yeah, I really like I like Jan's um, the idea of sort of what what I would call champion based funding. So a philanthropist identifies a series of champions who serve as experts and and um, really empowers those individuals to uh, and uses the judgment of those individuals to then you know motivate future um, future uh, grants and projects. So so I think that's one way you can use you can liberate philanthropic resources uh, in a way that you know, is quick and rapid. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Kevin or Christine, would you have any uh, last words on this? Yeah, sure. Um, I, would, I would say that this, is, this whole situation has been the most the most uh, fundamentally bizarre situation that the world has gone through in my lifetime. So you have to go back prior to my lifetime to like World War II to get something this strange. So now is a great time for visionaries of all stripes to step up. And, and I just want to mention, Andrew, and one thing you said in an earlier one was you have a special interest in forgiveness, right? So this whole session has been about STEM and you know I'm all about STEM. But there are opportunities elsewhere, right? There are some really interesting opportunities in other parts of life as well. So, <clears throat> it's, so we can take that energy uh, and uh, see how far we can push things right now this year. Yeah, All right, yeah. thank you so Yes, Kevin. Oh, and I, I agree with Christine, like this crazy time that we're living in. Um, and I think it ultimately highlights like in order to achieve human resilience, um, there are some paths that we can take and that the longevity field is currently taking. And I think in terms of, there are certainly like billionaires that have been early adopters to this movement. Um, and there's groundbreaking clinical trials that are going on that will ultimately, hopefully sway public perception in realizing that um, in order to improve human resilience, there we, we're, we're able to improve human resilience. So that's kind of the takeaway that I want everyone to have. Thank you so much. Hey, I can't thank you enough. I'm kind of, uh, I'm blown away by how much we managed to cover in an hour. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, for sticking around for like five minutes more. Um, I think we're going to hand it over to uh, Lou in a sec um, for doing some sharing of Bit of Hope uh, with uh, participants. If, if you're interested in panelists, obviously, you know, very, very welcome to stay on. 
you know, I just want to say, because it's, I've mentioned it already in the chat, feel free to scroll up if you're interested, but a few folks have asked me kind of like what's on uh, Foresight's plate now, and you know, because I think a few folks have only recently found out about Foresight and it is 34 years old, right? But we're definitely, we're a super small organization. Uh, we run on a super tight budget. And while I think on the one hand, we do see kind of like, you know, potential economic downturn approaching, there's also now with those salons, especially this kind of crazy opportunity unlocked to do something much more global, right? And I'm really blown away by how many of you uh, across the world are like able, willing, and, uh, and to cooperate uh, on, on, on those quite ambitious visions and, uh, and are really kind of like putting in so much uh, effort and work every day into those salons. So thank you so much for this. I do want to say, you know, if you're interested in supporting this and if you're interested in growing like a global network and community out of this, uh, please consider uh, supporting us in this. We would love to, for example, hire like a coordinator for those programs so we can set global nodes and we can zoom into, uh, into different parts of the world and maybe visit in person once it's possible again. I think there is a really good opportunity right now to kind of take this, uh, this, this movement for beneficial futures uh, global. So if you're interested in that, uh, please, please reach out to me. Um, I would love to talk if you're interested in, you know, contributing to the Existential Hope uh, website and, and, and to this onboarding document for the next generation and trying to make them see why different and positive futures are possible and how we could get there. Uh, basically, the hope is to create a book that could be handed to a person, member of the next generation in a day um, uh, that they could get through in a weekend and would be onboarded on why positive futures are possible and desirable and how they could plug in. And I think this definitely requires input from all of you. And uh, we would ultimately love to hire uh, writers for this. If you're interested uh, in, uh, in supporting this uh, in any way, please also reach out to me. Um, with that being said, I can't thank you enough to all of the speakers that, uh, that uh, were donating their time today. Um, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm very, very, very happy and grateful that you made it here. I hope that I'll see you in potential future, future sessions and I'll follow up with you if you would like to share links with participants. Uh, on how they can how they can get involved and, and to guide them a little bit more for for now i definitely don't want to take up uh, away um, more of your time so i'm going to close it out from my end and we'll follow up with everyone later and i'm going to hand it over uh, to lou right now for those who'd like to stay on and do some more interactive sharing uh, all right bye bye everyone thank you so so much for joining Lou, I unmuted you. Uh, yeah, thank you for unmuting me, Alison. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, as it is every day. Very nice to see you all. Um, so, um, as you know, if we if you have stuck around uh, for a post salon before, this time is like a space that's a little bit more for you. Um, I think the thing that's hard for us uh, event facilitators is uh, how do we recreate the corridors, you know, this like interactive moment uh, outside of the salon. Um, and um, so I have a few prompts for um, uh, like sharing an introspection at the same time for you. Um, I can share them here, sorry. Um, as Christine was just saying, uh, we are living through really exceptional and bizarre times. And I think as we uh, live through this, it's really interesting to explore how these time, uh, times change us. And I think the, the basis for um, this series, for some reason I can't uh, put the prompts in the chat, so I'll just read them to you. Um, the basis for this salon was thinking about um, yeah, how can we create a different future for, from this moment of crisis? And uh, so the idea here is to explore this in yourself. So my question for you today is uh, which aspects uh, of, your, of our current lives do you find yourself wanting to keep? And which aspects of your old life um, do you miss? I'll put it here in the chat. Um, if someone wants to um, share something on this, maybe raise your hand or use the raise your hand function. Um, something that's quite clear for me is that, uh, for instance, I'll, I'll share something. I really, um, I really enjoy like how many events we've been able to put up with foresight. Thanks to this salon, it's been incredible. We've done like. Um, 
maybe as many events in uh, just a few weeks as we've done like in a few years. Um, and uh, it's been fantastic. And at the same time, I kind of miss, as I told you, like this corridors, meeting people um, outside the event and be able uh, to interact um, in a more like decentralized way. And um, this is why like we are really trying to um, to to recreate this feeling with the Slack, with the Google group, uh, with the chat, and we hope like you find some satisfaction in there. But um, if you have also some ideas to make this better, we are always uh, very grateful for your input. Um, so let's see, is there anyone who I have? Uh, Ginadi or Ginadi, you're raising your hand. Alisa, maybe you can unmute them. I think he was still raised from uh, before, but I, I saw that Christina posted ah, uh, in the Slack. So I'm going to, um, sorry, in the chat. So I'm going to unmute her, okay? Christina, yes, you're unmuted now. Oh, yeah. Um, hi. I'm sorry. I'm not so into the, um, the video, but uh, yeah, I was just wondering, I don't hear too much about, you know, there's a lot of, you know, how, how is life going to change? And no one ever mentions um, feminism and the importance of, of women around the world and what women bring to the table. Um, and the importance of making sure that everyone um, have the, the funds, the potential, the, what, the funds and the opportunity to, to be a well, -ed, to, to gain a great education so that they can participate in the present and the future. Uh, so, so I just think, you know, it would be great to, to, to think about that and, and hear more about that. Um, also, um, uh, you know, what, what, why, do we, why do we think this, this virus is um, supposed to sort of rearrange uh, 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 the, the global uh, geopolitic? Um, if it is just a virus, it shouldn't really be too difficult to handle. Um, we are the cleanest, you know, at this point in history, we, we, we have the best ways of eradicating um, microbes, bacteria, and viruses. And um, around the world in general, um, we're, we're clean. Uh, we're, we're clean. We're a clean species. Um, so I, I wonder a bit about, about this. Um, uh, I actually think a lot of the, a lot of what we are doing to prevent the spread of the virus is, a, is, is uh, an overreaction. And I think it's a dangerous overreaction. Um, there seems to be a little bit uh, of, uh, I hate to use the word, well, I don't know, totalitarianism, fascism, are, are, are powerful words, but in general, there, there seems to be something of, um, uh, there seems to be uh, a, a bit of oppression when it comes to, or an oppressive attitude when it comes to really discussing the situation. So that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> and I'm sorry about the, uh, the lack of video imaging right now, but I've been having some difficulties with it and I don't know if you get the right image. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Christina. Um, a few a few things to to respond to you. I think um, why does the world have to change? Um, in my opinion, but maybe you know this is just a, a feeling. The the collective uh, the the impression this moment in time will do on the collective consciousness uh, will change things, and it's it's not you know it's so strong as Christine said like. To find such bizarre times, you have to go back to World War II, and World War II did transform um, uh, the, the world like deeply. Um, and so it's more like, you know, um, it will happen. But I think there might be some really good aspects to it, and also some dangerous aspects. I think um, potential for uh, more surveillance in reaction to uh, the, the fear of this virus is definitely something uh, that needs to be monitored. Um, and uh, finally, I like your point about um, women and women education. Again, I think that could be a really positive um, outcome. 
uh, I've also heard of uh, or read uh, articles about um, the increase of uh, domestic violence. So this is also like a danger, um, potential danger for, for women while, um, and, and uh, all genders actually, uh, because domestic violence uh, is, not, is not only toward women. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, so this, this again, like this crisis definitely has affects like many, many aspects of our lives. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting to share about them. I see a lot of comments in the um, chat. Is there, uh, Alison, did you see some that cut your eye or? Um, Can I say one more thing? Have Paul, yes, yes. Um, do you, I mean, you use the word, you, you referenced World War II. Do you think, um, you know, World War II was, you know, meant to eliminate millions and millions and millions of people. Um, you know, at this point in time, there really shouldn't be any virus with that sort of power. Um, you know, I, you know, you're right. You know, it did, uh, it, it, it took out a lot of people and uh, money's changed hands some nations grew grew stronger others grew weaker um but it, it it really we really shouldn't get to that point you know or that just that just shouldn't happen and i i wonder if anyone here has any commentary or any thoughts on on new thoughts on on um new thoughts on anything i've said any new thoughts please uh, say in the chat <laughs> I'll just, um, of course, this virus is not going to, I mean, hopefully, and it doesn't seem that it's headed this way, like um, result in the death of, of as many people as uh, World War II did, um, gratefully. Um, and, um, but like the change can be different, right? It can be something else. And I think another moment we could compare it to perhaps is 9-11 uh, and how like uh, things were very different after that, like in airports and security and it like, again, um, changed the world like in some way and the way we all live. So you think it yeah, could be had an a act of war or an act of terror, do you think? Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat? Do you think that the war could, or I'm sorry, do you think that this virus situation uh, could have, could be, could have been released as an act of war or as an act of terror? Oh, um, personally, from what I've read, um, it really does not seem so. Um, and there is strong uh, scientific evidence that this is a, a, a virus that was like, born naturally uh, and you can usually um, see virus who have been created in uh, laboratories have a like very specific um, um, uh, I would say encoding um, but yeah this is only from the evidence that I have seen so far so uh, yeah that's it and I think um, Paul Paul wanted yeah. to say something? Maybe you can unmute him, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll unmute Paul. Yep, I'll unmute Paul next. I do want to say, uh, in terms of what Lou said about, you know, um, comparing it to uh, past crisis and what came out of it, we did have a salon on, you know, how can that the Renaissance came after, um, uh, like after a crisis. And uh, I'm going to post a link to that. Uh, that was with Tyler Altman, where we tried to imagine new worlds that are possible after COVID-19 that were impossible before, because often you have an incredibly flourishing time that can emerge from a crisis. So to kind of like a little bit in this. Um, is everyone able to understand Alison? I can't hear you. Um, okay, I think we lost Alison. Am I host? No. Um, I kind of wanted to. Um, let's see. Is there anyone who is co host and could unmute Paul for me? Otherwise, um, we'll have to wait until Alison <laughs> pops back in. 
Um, what I will do is I will uh, uh, give you the rest of the prompts so that, oh, I, Rachel, it seems that you're a host now. Um, maybe it's because Alison got disconnected, so you inherited the title. Are you here, Rachel? <laughs> do you think you could uh, unmute Paul if you know how to do that? Yes. Great. One minute. Okay. Well, this is definitely well, a collaborative and decentralized salon. Now we are switching hosts. <laughs> and I'll put you this. This is one. great. Who is the host now? Who is the host? It's Rachel. It's Rachel. <laughs> okay. I can still and Rachel. I can unmute Rachel. Hey, I'm gonna unmute Rachel and I'm I'm and I'm gonna unmute Paul if he wants to answer. Okay. And I'm sorry. Make me, name me co-host also. <laughs> so it looks like I was the host for just a moment. And as soon as I went to unmute Paul, I lost it. So I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm back. I'm back as co-host. That's why. <laughs> okay. Paul, you're now muted. Well, let me start off with this. Since there's a lot of energy going on, I'll start off with a, a bit of a... Okay, um, so I didn't get a chance to address any of the questions when we had the uh, collaborators. Um, and since this topic is advan uh, advancing high impact science and technology, I've been reviewing over a lot of the uh, data, the maps, the graphs, everything about COVID-19 and one element or one signal that I haven't found that I think is extremely significant is um, the concept of metabolic dysfunction. And as far as money and funding is concerned, the idea of preventative health um, is so much less expensive um, since it appears to be the um, interleukin-6 signal um, has been shown when it's rising, you know, and people are getting sick and they're going on ventilators. Make a long story short, um, if we can focus on everyone to attempt to the best opportunity to establish metabolic homeostasis. This is probably, in my opinion, and I'm actually um, refer referencing this off the work that I've been studying from Creon Levitt. So I don't claim to have the original ideas here, but I am on board with what Creon has been um, broadcasting loud and clear. So money, funding, should go into the preventative medicine if we can then extract the data from all these people that are getting sick, they're taking blood tests. Why are there not any metabolic um, data being displayed with all these people that are showing our positive COVID? That's a question. I don't have the answer now. So that's a big one for me. Yeah, actually, this is, um, I think there was a little switch in our emails this morning, uh, but um, advancing high impact science is tomorrow's topic. Today, it was a philanthropy and investment for a long term future. So there's um, no. And I no... think Erica, there is Erica, Erica Frank, um, who has uh, an answer for you, and I'm excited to. Give us a floor. Um, so I just wanted to, I wanted to sum up that as far as investment is concerned, preventative health is the least expensive investment. The maximum punch, maximum um, bang for the buck is going to be to try and get people towards, home towards metabolic homeostasis. And it can be done quite effectively and easily with the right kind of public awareness. So that's why I was referencing this to investment. And as far as those 
uh, people who have been designated from the billionaires as the, you know, I call them the money managers. There was a different term used, but I think um, it's a very important topic. And also during the, um, the, the main session, I'm not quite sure why all of us are muted and we can't unmute in case there's some more yeah, collaborative. There's, there's, I'm sorry about this. You know, we really want it to be interactive. In the beginning, we had a completely unmuted salon and it was very uh, fluid and participants could jump in until we had some Zoom bombers and um, it was totally unmanageable. Um, so, you know, I, I really wish we could have everyone unmuted, but we have to have uh, everyone muted, otherwise uh, some people uh, enjoy taking the space to make some practical jokes uh, that are not so funny on our side. And on that note, I will uh, give uh, the floor to Erica, uh, who wanted to give you an answer and uh, is, um, is a doctor. Erica, I think you're unmuted. Uh, not yet. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, good. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm operating on two devices. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I'm a physician um, specialist in preventive medicine, did a preventive medicine residency at Yale and a three-year preventive medicine fellowship at Stanford. So this is something that I've been talking a lot with Creon about in particular because my other most important credential is I'm Creon's cousin. Um, so um, there is definitely a clear emergence of um, the sort of the fundamental principles that we've known about chronic disease prevention. Um, it seems exceedingly clear at this point that metabolic syndrome and its sisters um, and all of their common risk factors um, are largely responsible for both morbidity and mortality from COVID. And even as simple as an intervention, which Kree and I were talking about this morning, is vitamin D, um, seems to be enormously efficacious um, for this, um, for this uh, virus as well as for others. So, um, yeah, I think that there is, um, there is clearly an opportunity to leap forward um, to, instead of just bouncing back. Uh, but uh, I think we all need to be wary about Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and the other pieces that have been brought up in these salons that um, there is the possibility that the same forces that promote sugar and tobacco and lethargy will continue to do so. Yeah, and let's let's hope uh, it happens. And I think this is also definitely uh, Creon's hope is like that uh, we have this sort of uh, really uh, understanding of what health is and uh, get get healthier and the whole world get healthier as a result of this crisis. Uh, I guess there is one minute left if someone had a very short contribution uh, but otherwise i am going to wrap it up here i don't see any um hands raised uh right here so Was someone ed suggested to ah uh, i'm sorry i i just noticed that ed yaris was going to say something earlier i i don't know ed but i was wondering if if we were going to um um ask him what if he had a response Could you hear me? Sorry. Um, uh, a few minutes ago, right before Paul began to speak, Ed was going to say something, and I was wondering if we could hear what he what his response was to the question of to the question of I guess humanism, feminism, life changing right now. Um, whether... I'm, I'm unmuted now. I think Christina. Thank you. Great, great, great. All yeah. right. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess a couple kind of thoughts occurred to me. One is that I have a client that is a women's resource center and the ripples of this virus come out in strange ways. They house women who have been involved in domestic abuse, often on a temporary basis, obviously, looking for them to get established in some new ways. 
then they have the questions of how do they disinfect the place uh, when somebody moves out. They have the problem with their office right now that their maintenance person is significant other, and he's 70, I don't know what his significant other's age is, came down with the virus and the maintenance person has been throughout their building. They're trying to figure out how to bring people back in some way. They're also concerned about the isolation of the staff that is handling uh, support for people who've been in abuse situations uh, because they feel when they're in the office they can give more direct support at a distance is a new challenge. So it's just a comment that there are these other levels of stuff that go on that we don't see as easily uh, that are some real challenge for the people working with it. And I work with the woman in a coaching environment uh, once a month for a couple of hours to try to talk through some options for her. So I wound up sending her an article by an author named John Katz, who has organized what he calls the army of good. And he gets people to donate to a nursing home uh, up near him in upstate New York. And one of his donations was a disinfectant fogger for the nursing home. So I worked to pass on that information to the executive director of the Women's Resource Center in case it might be of some use for her, either in her building or in terms of the other facilities they have for housing. And I guess the kind of overall message is how do we keep using the share button? You know, it's a, it's a symbol of our age and it has tremendous power if we learn how to share and cooperate. And I think those things might be better explained as a feminist perspective, at least my wife has taught me by hitting me over the head for the last 50 years to appreciate some of these things a little bit differently than my engineering training uh, had me. I ask more who questions anymore, not just what and how and how to get the answer to two decimal points. Uh, so my work at the moment is who questions, who else can I connect with here? Who else can I learn from? Uh, who else can I get to help solve the problem of the fuel cell that we're working on that's using a liquid hydrocarbon that will allow us to use the existing infrastructure instead of building new transmission lines to ship energy across the country and take it out as a fuel cell? You know, it's all who for me. The scientists are still asking what and how. I'm trying to take what I consider, because my wife taught it to me, uh, a more feminist, I guess, approach. And she headed a, a rape crisis center and started one some years ago. Uh, so uh, I've been attuned in a variety of different ways. I'll stop there. Thank you, Christina, for uh, getting me involved for a second. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Ed. It was really great to, uh, to, to hear your input. Uh, it's great to hear that you're, you're actively doing something for the women in your area. Um, yeah, this is great, Ed. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution. I also work actually with uh, a group that is uh, uh, sort of stewarding uh, people who have trouble or suffer from uh, content violations um, and domestic violence. So we can maybe connect over this on uh, Slack. Are you on Slack? Uh, I have not gotten in there yet. I'm finding the flow of information on both the Google uh, process and the notes or, or groups and Slack kind of overwhelming because I have another whole project that we're working at the moment and we're building a wiki at the moment to collect energy information uh, and a new organization and a lot of other things. So I tap in, I put Got my it. toe in the water or my Got sampling it. stick to learn a little bit and then I have to kind of move away because it's just, it's so fast and so much. Of course, uh, if people want to connect with you to answer all your who's question, uh, where should they reach out? Very easy. I have an email address that's my name, ed at yarish, Y-A-R-R-I-S-H dot com. So again, ed at Y-A-R-R-I-S-H dot com. So if you see my name on the screen, you put a dot between the ed and the yarish and an at com at the end and you can reach me. Thank you, Paul, for putting okay, it up great. in the chat function. Great. Thank you, Paul, for putting it. Um, okay, thank you so much, everyone. It was a lovely session again. See you tomorrow at 11 uh, for accelerating high impact science. Bye. Have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.